Kedőség. Jóhelyes Mispat, a Hévatra, Tomantól és a Vén. Mispat, Zsakra, Biakó, Atta, Asziszó. Romogó Ármai a Hé, de is Tarnagó, Lahadom Ragó, Kedőség. Moshe, the Aharó, the Fahano. Mushmuel, the Korei Shimo. Korei Melanoi, the Huyane. Bamula non yada ber alayhem. Shamruwe dosro. The Chok, Vosan, Shlomo. Arnoi Eloheinu, Ato Anisom. El Nosei, Vagiso Lahem. The no came out of the ocean. The mohu arnoi Eloheinu, the hishtapahu, lahar kacho. Shikodosh arnoi Eloheinu. This is the book of the generations of men. The book symbolizes man. What is man if not a bundle of memories or a collection of stories? Jeremiah speaks of two books, the Sefer HaGolui, the open book, and the Sefer HaChasum, the sealed book. Ve'akach HaSefer HaMikno, ve'ese HaChasum, ve'ese HaGolui. So I took the book of purchase, both that which was sealed and that which was opened. Apparently, the Sefer of Tondot Adam, the Book of Man, is both It is an open book, a gallery, uninterruptedly telling the public story of man. The Sefer of Tildot Adam is also a sealed book containing the private tale of, of, of an unknown individual. No matter how well known he was to his contemporaries, the man leaves the world. He does live as an unknown individual. And the book which accompanied him is not the open book, but the private book. At the Mysterium Magnum, the greatest of all mysteries, namely man. The two books are concerned with two different questions. The Sefer HaGalui, the public book, the open book asks a very simple question. What did this particular individual do? What did he accomplish for society? What are his accomplishments? The public book is accomplishment oriented. And the, an the answer to this question, which is usually given, one is, is formulated not in words, but in figures. The Sefer Agaluk turns man whose story it is supposed to tell into a mathematical equation. The individual vanishes, disappears and he is replaced by an abstraction which tells us very little about real man himself. The private book, the Sefer HaChasum, asks a different question. It doesn't ask what did men do for society. It asks 
He was it. Never mind his accomplishments, but he was the individual himself. What's about his inner world? About everything in his personality? Which was so strange at times, so puzzling at times, and also so beautiful and so breathtaking. Let me say, the open book of Dr. Dalton is accessible to all. Everybody can glance through its pages and read the public story or the saga of Dr. Dalton. There is no need for me to repeat and to tell you what you have be, what you have known for so long. I want to devote my short remarks this morning to the private book of Dr. Dalton. Since no one has ever opened it up fully, even his closest friends knew who who thought that they knew Dr. Belkin well, did not glance into this book. It was very hard indeed to get, to gain an insight into Dr. Belkin's complex personality, into his rich, colorful, and at times enigmatic, I may even, with your permission, say, antithetic personality. The private book of Dr. Belkin remained a safer echosum, a sealed, mysterious book. Let us submit up now to the last opportunity before we beat farewell to him to read a few pages in that private book. He didn't confine to many and we know very little about it. Let me try to gain an insight into it. First question of the private book is, who was he? Not what did he accomplish. Who was he? I don't know. A certain word, I would like to use a certain word. I'm safe for glory to the run in order to portray Dr. Belkin. It's a verse consisting of five words, but I believe those five words tell the story of Dr. Belkin. We just read those four, five words in the Agada. Arami Eividovi Vayered Mitzrayma and I'm interpreting in accordance with the Rajban and the Rebbein, right? A straying, wandering, restless Aramean was my father. And he went down to Egypt. Puzzling sentence. Very enigmatic. Who was Ovi? Who was my father? Who was a restless Aramean? Some say the Pasuk refers to Abraham. Some say Joseph, a restless wanderer, wandering Aramean, who was my father, my teacher, my leader, Joseph, and his restlessness, because he was restless, he went to Egypt, was taken to Egypt. Why was Joseph a navate, a restless fellow? Because he was a dreamer, a visionary. We all know that he dreamt of many things, many. He dreamt of crops, harvest, and sheaves. He also dreamt of distant stars, 
and moon. He dreamt of material things as well as of spiritual values. Now let me paraphrase this passage. A restless Lithuanian Yeshiva Talmud student was my friend, Dr. Dalton. He always reminded me of Joseph of all. He also dreamt. He also beheld a vision. Whenever I entered his room unannounced, I didn't do it frequently. I used, to I used to find him dreaming. I simply saw the dream in his eyes. His glance used to be fixed on something far and on something unknown to me, please. Now the question is, what did he dream about? He was an Arami Ave, a restless, Lithuania. What did he dream about? He dreamt of a generation of young American Jews who combine, who would combine, both an excellent Torah education, and let me tell you, Dr. Dawkins' standards of wonders of Allahic scholarship were very high. I knew him well. He, I'll repeat. He dreamt of, his, of, young, of a generation of young American Jews who would combine both an excellent Torah education with the capability of participating in the scientifically oriented and technologically minded complex American economy. He used to tell me Talmidei Chachomim must not be denied the many career opportunities offered to the, Amer to the average American boy who attends another American academic institution. And he used to tell me many times, if we expect our plans concerning a thriving, dynamic, self-respecting, Jewish religious community to come through, then we must see to it that the latter, the Jewish religious community, be integrated in the very economy of our country, enjoying its blessings in full. It must not remain on the periphery and be envious of those who are in the center. Yeah, this is the dream of the sheep, who one sheep in the middle the other sheaves on the periphery. This was the part, the first part of his dream. Then, this dream was not as bold as the, as the second dream which I'm going to speak about. Another question arose. Who is supposed to provide the Bnei Torah, the Talmud HaChachomim, with the scientific training. Practical people said, let us teach them Torah and let them study medicine, physics, biology, etc. in secular non-Jewish institutions. However, Dr. Dalton the restless spirit, the Arami Eved, the restless nomad, had another dream. And the second dream was bolder, more daring than the first dream. This was his, this was his original dream. No one, no one shared his opinion, not even people who were very close to him. <laughs> Dr. Bolton used to tell me, if they can, why can't we? He wanted to show 
to the Jewish as well as the non-Jewish community that the Orthodox Jew is capable of establishing scientific educational institutions as the non-Jew or the secular Jew is. <laughs> he told me once that when he presented the plan of a medical school under the auspices of the yeshiva to an internationally known abdominal Jewish surgeon, that the latter became so indignant that he said the whole project is not only impractical, but arrogant as well. And perhaps he was right, the surgeon. It was arrogant. Now let me tell you, the restless yeshiva student of Lithuania, who was indeed, I knew him well, a tough, tough and arrogant. However, his arrogance was translated into reality. And isn't the Jew an arrogant person, defying for thousands of years the whole world? And isn't little Israel an arrogant nation, defying the United Nations of the world? Let me repeat the question, and I will give the first answer to this question. Who was he? Answer number one, he was a restless, arrogant, impudent student from Lithuania. Who dreamt of moons and suns, of heaven and earth? However, let me rephrase the question. Who was this tough, bold, restless dreamer? Who was it? What else was it? Or I could dream, I could be a dreamer of one. What else was it? And let me give you the second answer. The arrogant dreamer the restless Yeshiva Bachar, Raram Eve, who was a great teacher, a Rosh Yeshiva. This fact is not mentioned in the Sefer Agalui. Dr. Dalton, the Sefer Agalui in the press is a mathematical equation, not real man. This restless dreamer, who was a magnificent teacher, I have spent my life in teaching, I know teacher, he was a magnificent teacher, he was perhaps the teacher par excellence. This fact, as I said before, is not mentioned in the Sefer Agalui, in the public book. And I came to the Yeshiva so many years ago, Dr. Belkin taught Talmud, who was a Rosh Hashiva, in the junior class. The boys, his boys. Look right, I see a number of them right here in the auditorium. The boys, after spending a year or two in his class, used to come to me, to my class. And let me tell you, I can bear witness, the boys who were so well trained, so well prepared, that to teach them, as far as I was concerned, who was a source of pleasure. He taught them to think the way he thought, to think straight without getting involved in artificially complicated subtleties of thinking, of thought or in intellectual acrobatics. His disciples, who were the best trained boys in the yeshiva. You'll ask me, 
Why do I tell it to you now? Isn't it just a triviality? No, it is not a triviality. It's very important. He chose two things. First, he chose that Dr. Belkin was a great scholar. If one is not a scholar, I cannot be a good teacher. My father used to say, you have to know everything in order to teach something. He was a Gavre Rabo, a great scholar in the full sense of the word. Of course, he disliked sophistry, people. He was not the Harif type who tries to sharpen the minds of his students. He was, as we say it in our Hebrew colloquial, a bulk shot, who wanted to develop and train their minds. He knew how to do it. He always moved along the straight line. He knew neither of angles, nor of curves, nor of corners. His thinking was two-dimensional. His code, so to say, his code of arms, his lambdas, the symbol of his lambdas, who was the geometric plane. He did not engage in the so-called analysis of depth. He had no trust in the thin abstraction of three-dimensional thinking. But whatever he said was logical, was plain, was understandable. The fact that he was an excellent teacher shows something else. Not only his scholarship, but more than that. Whether one cannot teach Torah, cannot teach anything, but, but it's particularly valid with regard to Torah. One cannot teach Torah without being wholly, fully, unreservedly committed to it. There is no teaching without love. When I say love, I mean love of the student and love of the subject matter of the Torah one teaches. One cannot pass on knowledge unless the latter is part of himself, an integral part of himself. A teacher who is not involved, let me say not totally involved, in the Torah he teaches will never succeed. To teach means to get through to the pupil, to the tender, to his tender personality. How can one get through without love? And Dr. Belkin loved the Torah, who was devoted to her with all his might, with all his heart, with all his soul. And there is not a single exaggeration in my statement. He is responsible for the fact, only he, that Yeshiva Srebitz Kolchona now, as of today, is a great center of Torah, and that as far as the attainment of Londes, good Londes, good, real, genuine scholarship, is concerned, it is the best place in the United States. Just, you don't have to believe me, just take a look. At the young Roshi Yeshivas, who sit right to my, over there, to my right, they were trained right here. They are the finest Roshi Yeshivas. Any institution, here or, or, or in Israel, any institution, now 
at present or a hundred years ago would take or would have taken pride in them. Where were the trains, as I said, here? Of course, we were trained by the faculty of the Rosh Yeshiva. Correct. But all that transpired under his guidance. He carried his banner. He imbued us with the spirit, with the faith, and with the optimistic view that we'll finally emerge victorious. They tell a story about Marshal Foch, the commander-in-chief of the Allied forces in the First World War. He was asked once, after winning the decisive battle, whether he takes credit for himself for the victory. He answered, that I don't know, I can't give an answer. However, I do know something else, which is relevant to the question. Had the battle been lost, I would have been blamed. And that's what I say about Dr. Delphi. Is he, should he take credit, or should he give him credit now for the fact that hundreds of young American boys came in in a state of ignorance to the yeshiva and left the yeshiva as lombim? Or credit is not, we don't owe him any credit? I don't know, the way Marshal Ford said. But I know very well that if he had failed, he would have been right. That means credit is due to him. He was a Eftirat par excellence. Answer number two to the question, who was it? He was a restless dreamer who was an excellent teacher and who was in love with God. He had a romance with God. He told me once, it is great, isn't it? It was years ago. If one can engage in a romance with God, he's happy. Yeah, but now let let me ask the second question. Who was this restless teacher, Rosh Yeshiva, and lover of the Torah? Who was he again? We would like to know a little more about him. But let us probe it, his personality. Let me give another answer. He was, Dr. Belkin was, Dr. Belkin was a charming person. He radiated, I'll use the biblical expression for it, Chayn, Chayn is Shah. The restless teacher, the lover of Torah, like Joseph of old, again, attracted people. He was indeed charming. He, en he enchanted them with his magnetic personality. Even those who disagreed with him, and quite often I disagreed with him, quite often, even those who disagreed with him succumbed to his powerful charm. The Emperor's Yosef, the Emperor's Aurelian. What is Hain? in contradistinction to Yofi, to beauty. Pain, charm, flows from within, while beauty is an external trait of a person. While the latter is not indicative 
אתן את פרסונליסטית. גרייטנס חן רפרקט אינינה כריזמה, a rich personality, and inspired the human being. And Dr. Belkin indeed was a charismatic personality. Therefore, he attracted people. So let me just analyze Dr. Belkin's charisma. What was his charm? What did it consist of? The charisma Dr. Belkin possessed, who was precipitated by two basic virtues. Virtue number one. Let me use the Hebrew expression for it. He was a Baal Chesed. He was a man of loving kindness. He was a kind person. And let me say, his kindness was not due to character weakness. Sometimes people are kind because they are weak. or character softness. Sometimes people are kind because they are soft. Dr. Belkin was not a weak person. He was tough, they said before, and firm. He was a man who exercised power and he liked power. At times, he could even act as an autocrat. But nevertheless, nevertheless, he was a kind person. He personified kindness. He helped people in distress. He practiced what the Talmud calls Imlus Hasodim Bimomene Ube Gufei, kindness as far as money is concerned and kindness as far as physical efforts are concerned. When he was a just a young teacher, when I came to that institution with a meager salary, which was not always paid on time, he used to give away money, his last money, to poor students. There are a number of students who, had, who could confirm my story, right here in the hall. And many students told me, many boys told me, that if not for Dr. Belkin's helping hand, he would have never completed their studies. He, in spite of the fact that he was not sentimental, had the ability to share in the pain or in the misery of others. He had the ability and might experience the distress of other people. He had an open hand, an open pocket, and an open heart. Without being overwhelmed by sentiment. By sentiment. It was very reserved, very restrained. He never expected people the people whom he helped to reciprocate. And hardly a few reciprocated. Hardly a few. He just did what he felt he should do and dismissed the whole incident from his mind. If there was a person who was not appreciated by his own friend, this was Dr. Bell. He was the most unappreciated restless dreamer, an excellent teacher, and kind person, the most unappreciated in the world. Of course, the one who oppressed me again, what else was he? All right, he was a good teacher, a dreamer, an excellent teacher, a kind person, a lover of Torah. What else was he? I'll tell you something. He was, and this will come as a surprise to many of you in the hall, he was a saintly person. He possessed saintliness. 
I don't see holiness. I see sin. Kindness alone does not generate or precipitate charismatic charm, chain, unless it is tightly knit with saintliness. And Dr. Belkin was the same to us. And I understand that you ask me, in what manner, in what respect, did he manifest saintliness? I'll tell you. In four, in four respects. First, he was a saintly butter. He hated gain. You know the biblical expression, saintly butter to hate gain, to hate profit, to hate money. A saintly person is a saintly person. And Dr. Dawkins while he knew the importance of money as far as the institution was concerned, he had no concept of and no desire for money as far as he, as he himself was concerned. I remember my wife of blessed memory used to rebuke him quite often, actually preach to him and criticize him for his complete indifference concerning his own financial security. She used to quote the verse, song of songs, of Shira Shirin, Samim in the Torah, Tatramim, Samim Shalim in the Torah, they made me keeper of the vineyard, of the yard, I did not keep well. Dr. Belkin used to promise with a smile, with a charming smile, to mend his way. and to care a little more and to worry not only about the yeshiva budget but about himself as well of course he never kept his word never his promise and I believe I don't know what I believe he died a poor man he died a poor man because he was a saintly man he was a saintly man because he was a great man. And he died a great man. He simply was a saintly butter. He raised so much money, he was a wizard. A wizard as a saint solicitor. It's very rare imagination and free pertaining to the financial security of the institution. It was a plain, and I'll use it, a Hebrew colloquial, <coughs> colloquial, a plain button with regard to his own interest and need. And really, really, I remind myself of the psalm, of the same Regova Lidi, the Romeo and I, the Yolachti Big Baby, the Nifroi, the Nani, Yachin and Yisroi, the Lolachim, the Yatovi Adonai. My God, as far as I'm concerned, I don't excise myself in things too great or in things too wonderful for me. I have enough, whatever I have. And I don't ask for more. However, as far as Israel is concerned, as the people is concerned, I want more and more. As far as Israel is concerned, my fantasy, my imagination is limitless. Yachin is Israel, I tell you. You ask every other one, from this time first, and forever. Dr. Dalton was a simply person for a different reason. Dr. 
also a saintly person in his relationship to Yisrael. Dr. Belkin knew how to accept suffering. He suffered with dignity. Dr. Belkin knew, as I said, to suffer, how to meet crisis, and how to confront disaster. He never complained. I've never heard from him. I've never had a single complaint from him. He never complained. He never asked any, asked any questions. He never engaged in self-righteous monologues. Vaido Maron, and Aaron said nothing. A great man, a saintly man, says nothing. He was silent, Dr. Belvin. A saintly person must possess the heroic quality to have being mute at a time when one, one is ready to talk. Dr. Belkin all, all, had all four virtues. Sinas Botza, Trisha Minatanugim, Washington and Kabbalah Sayyusurim. He hated gain. He could withdraw. The movement of recoil was known to him. He had dignified, dignified speech, clean, dignified speech. In general, he was clean. In worldly, he was clean. And he knew how to suffer and to sacrifice. That's why he had a charismatic personality. Saintliness together with kindness made a charismatic personality. Of course, I could go on and on to tell you about it. This kind, sa saintly man has departed from us. It is hard to imagine, particularly, that at the next yeshiva celebration, Dr. Belkin will not be present, will not sit next to me, and will not whisper something into my ear. 
I can hardly visualize leaving the yeshiva in September before Rosh Hashanah or in March or April before Pesach without going up to the fifth floor. We didn't talk much to each other. But somehow his mere presence used to have a cathartic, redemptive influence upon me. There was peace in him. And this feeling of peace was very contagious. And suddenly I used to find peace within myself. And I believe the Rashi Yeshiva right here will not mind if I'll tell Dr. Dalton in a few words. The Rashi Yeshiva here feel very lonely. Very lonely. They indeed mourn your passing. They cannot separate. They cannot imagine the Yeshiva without Dr. Dalton. They prayed for you during the last 10 months of your illness. And they refused to accept the frightening news about the medical diet prognosis. We simply refused to accept it. Even though that we deep down our heart, we knew that the prognosis was true. We acted like the disciples of Judah the Prince of Rabbi Akorish, who said when the great master who was about to die, Polarina Rebenes, Dr. Becherev, whoever will bring the bad tidings that the master has died, he will be killed, murdered. I used to resent anybody who told me that my optimism is unfounded. However, it happened. We prayed for a miracle. The mi we are, apparently, we were unworthy of the miracle. It happened. We can ask just to bid you farewell. We promise you that the Yeshiva will be guarded by us. And it will continue to be a great center of Torah. Your name will never be forgotten. Rainy <laughs> Eshmosam <laughs> Kimi mini balemot, lochein so machli bi, by your girl kodi, ap sorry yishkon loveta, ki lo sazov na shili show, lo titein chasid choli ro shocha, todi eni ora chayim, tovas machos es konecho, ni mos di mincho netza. Kvura, the interment, will take place at the Bethel Cemetery, Paramus, New Jersey. Please remain standing at your seats until the Aron casket followed by the family, Rashi HaYeshiva, members of the various boards of the university, 
and leading administrators and dignitaries have left the hall. The Nose Oron pallbearers have been taken from among the earliest students and disciples of Dr. Tolkien. And all his former students who are here will follow. You may accompany the Oron until 182nd Street, where the hearse will halt sufficiently to allow all those who plan to go to the cemetery to get to their cars and join the funeral procession. Those who lack transportation and wish to attend the burial should go to the entrance of the first hall building on 185th Street, where suitable provision has been made. As we are in the midst of the Passover festival, Shiva, which will be sat at the Belkin residence by Mrs. Abby Belkin and Linda, 101 Central Park West, will begin Thursday evening at 7.45 p.m., continue Friday until 1 p.m. so that the family can prepare for Shabbos, and then resume at Sabbath's end, Saturday evening at 7.45 p.m. through Wednesday morning after services at approximately 9 a.m. Morning and evening services will be held in Dr. Belkin's Zatzal's home. The Rashi HaYeshiva, the Estadrut Mosmache HaYeshiva Rabbinic Alumni, and the Talmidei HaYeshiva, the thousands of students of our Yeshiva, have solemnly undertaken the study of the entire Mishnayis during Shloshim, the initial 30-day period of mourning, as well as Chalukah Sashas, the division and the completion of the study of the entire Talmud itself by the first Yerzeit, the first anniversary of the passing of Moreinu Rabbeinu, Harab Reb Shmuel ben Shlomo Pelkin, Zecher Tzarek Rachman, which will be part of our individual and collective dedication to the most sainted memory of Rebbe, a Hesped memorial assembly in Mirza Hashem will be held at Yeshiva at the conclusion of the Shloshim. I ask the poor bearers who have been designated come to the earth.